Welcome to this afternoon's conversation. My name is JD. I'll be moderating. My job here is to largely get out of the way and let the experts do the talking. And we have two tremendous experts here to talk about kind of the general state of battery manufacturing, the good, the bad, the ugly, but really I think the inventive is really at the heart. Uh, and the two of you have had a long-standing relationship, which we'll get into, which is cool because I moderate some panels, not everyone knows each other, but this is a rare off where your two companies have done a lot of work for, uh, for quite some time. So let me start with uh, an introduction. Landon, I'll kick things off with you. Uh, talk to me about, and, and to the crowd, who you are and what you do for Peak Energy for anyone who might be otherwise a bit unfamiliar. Yep, uh, I'm Landon Mossberg. I'm founder and CEO of Peak Energy. Been in batteries for most of my career. Uh, started uh, working on that out in uh, 2012 at Tesla. Uh, joined there right at the beginning of Model S ramp and was there for about five years, then went to Northvolt uh, in 2017, right at the beginning, uh, joined when we were around 20 people as chief automation officer and um, brought up our first 500 megawatt hour pilot line, really learned that I knew very little about battery manufacturing in, during that process and how complex everything is, but also sort of fell in love with it. Uh, and um, around uh, that time, I kind of started learning about sodium ion and it seemed like uh, potentially the, the best possible technology for this this next uh, phase of the battery industry. And, and uh, after trying to do it at Norfolk for a little while, I uh, decided it was too good to pass up, so left the company and founded Peak Energy. Uh, and uh, it was about two, was, I left three years ago, we founded the company about two years ago. Every great innovative idea needs some venture power behind it. Nicholas, that's where you step in. Talk to us about your role at TDK Ventures. Yep, so my name is Nicolas Sauvage, president of TDK Ventures. We are the corporate VC arm of TDK, the tech firm that maybe some of you know from the TDK cassette times. We have moved on and we now are in uh, passive components, sensors, batteries, basically every com com um, tablets and mobile phones and cars have TDK inside. Mm -hmm. And so we've invested in so far 44 portfolio companies, including Peak Energy. We really invest in the material science of really hard tech, the ones that are very tough to invest. Earlier today, we had a panel with PH7 from Vancouver, which is one of our portfolio companies. And we have raised four funds, and the asset under management is now half a billion dollars. So we really have the ability to support uh, entrepreneurs to go all the way to scaling and being very successful with their products and contribute to society, which is our number one mission. Absolutely. Uh, when we kick off a panel like this, I always like to kind of set the scene for audience members who might be a bit unfamiliar to the general background or kind of how we got here. Mm -hmm. And this is a focus on U.S. Uh, battery manufacturing. So an open question for both of you. Talk to me about how we have gotten where we are. And that includes a lot of the missteps or maybe the fundamental mm -hmm. misunderstandings, mm -hmm. given that what you do does require so much government support, regulatory support. Mm -hmm. But really, Landon, how do you diagnose how we got where we are? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting story because really a lot of the foundations for the battery industry started in the U.S. Um, everything from like, you know, the, the good enough lithium ion work that was foundational pioneering back um, even before the turn of the, the century. And then um, A123, one of, being one of the big first shots at commercializing EV batteries at scale. Um, but like, I, I think the, the short sort of story of the U.S. is like we, we kind of come up with a a great idea. Uh, we we do the fundamental research. We get it sort of into the lab, then maybe into pilot, and then we fumble the ball. Uh, and companies go bankrupt. The IP is up on the market. Somebody buys it. Uh, Canada has a huge part of this too. Like one of the first battery companies, Molly Energy, uh, and uh, they were trying to commer commercialize what is was effectively like a lithium metal battery. So really aggressive chemistry. Uh, when you hear solid state, that's what a lot of the solid state companies are still trying to work on. They were doing that you know, way back. Uh, and Molly was shipping batteries at scale, and then there were some fires. Uh, they went bankrupt, and uh, um, I think a Taiwanese cement conglomerate bought them, who still owns them now, right? So they're actually a Ta Taiwanese company. A123 was bought by a, a Chinese conglomerate. So um, you know, I think it's a, it's a story of like, Really great about the first parts of the of the transition, but then like once once it uh, requires a bit longer term investment and more patient capital and sort of seeing it through, I think our our uh, for whatever reason I think our system is less good at, at taking it to that next stage. I like the way you said that. It's not just capital; it's patient capital. Nicholas, I know that's where you step in because I know your yep. work at TDK. You have to see where the puck is going. And oftentimes, that's an appropriate hockey metaphor for being here in Canada. <laughs> you have to, right? You have to, right? And, and I think oftentimes for your situation, mm -hmm. you have to see things that maybe a lot of other 
folks don't yeah. in the space. Why were you always so bullish, so optimistic, specifically on these sodium ion based solutions, so important to the role at, uh, at Peak Energy? Yeah, I, I wanted to add something to what Landon said, which I think when you outsource manufacturing because you think it's something that doesn't need a lot of expertise, that's one of the problems. Because manufacturing is extremely hard, there's a huge amount of know how. And when you think you're outsourcing the manufacturing, you're actually outsourcing the know-how that's critical for you to keep innovating. And that's what Lendon, all his career has been about, manufacturing know-how and improving things. I think there's a, Elon Musk said, I think it's easy to do one car. Mm. It's super hard to do millions of them. Mm. And so back to your, where the perk is going, our job as venture capitalists, I think, is to try to imagine futures. We like to imagine beautiful futures, but we can also think about futures which are not so nice. Mm. And uh, about four years ago, we started looking at what could be the future when the world becomes highly fragmented. Let's assume, for a second, the geopolitics will not get any better. Let's assume that some of the critical materials we need today for electrification and for AI is not going to be available anymore. And then we backcast from that future and we try to find entrepreneurs working on the, on the solutions needed for that type of future. And of course, sometimes we dream the perfect future, like compute going to zero, energy, green energy going to zero cost, uh, the future of home that's ideal. But we have to diversify our, our set of futures. And when we thought about a very fragmented world where maybe lithium and nickel and cobalt are not available anymore, mm. how do we power the grid? How do we power AI? How do we power the electrification we need for society to continue? And that's where we build confidence through deep explorations we had done, I think, one year earlier before we met, uh, that sodium ion batteries, which doesn't have the accidents, uh, uh, the flame that can come out when you puncture a battery and so on, but which has all the materials available locally, it's salt. I mean, I'm just <laughs> simplifying. <laughs> and we thought, OK, we want to invest. And then we searched for one year, and we couldn't find any company that we believed that the management team with the competency and the know-how, again, all outsourced somewhere else, not in the US, but also the technology, the vision, and the ability to think about sodium ion as a product launch. So it's, it's the first product, but then it could be new chemistry in the future. And that's when we met with Landon and through VC partners, including Eclipse, which is one of the best VC I know in hard tech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we invested at inception of the company because we believed in the team, which is truly <laughs> remarkable, but the vision. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting because Nicholas mentions, I think, a few household names in terms of these raw materials. People know lithium, nickel, cobalt, et, mm -hmm. et cetera. But using U.S. soda ash, this is a fundamentally mm -hmm. different product for sodium carbonate yep. that I don't know that so many people quite have the exposure to. Yep. Can you give us a bit of a background about how you take the knowledge base that many people have on the lithiums and cobalts yeah. of the world versus how you are doing things fundamentally differently yeah. at peak. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, I think that's the advantage of sodium ion is it's, it's like similar enough to lithium ion that you can leverage a lot of the same manufacturing platforms, some of the same supply chain. So you're not starting from scratch. You have a lot of scale benefit already. Um, but then it's different enough where like for some of these really constrained things like um, you know, uh, lithium carbonate's really hard to bring up in refining capacity and all that stuff. Sodium carbonate is already the, uh, I think it's like the 10th most used inorganic uh, um, material in, in the world. Uh, number one on that list is water, right? So, so it's like uh, very prevalent. Uh, you can synthetically make it pretty cheaply, but the U.S. has the world's largest natural reserves of it, uh, proven natural reserves. They're, they're in uh, Wyoming. It's 92% of the world's natural reserves. So there's like this is abundant, it's not constrained. Any country can make it synthetically, but uh, North America has a bit of a raw materials advantage over others. So it's just kind of a natural, if you want to de-bottleneck on the supply chain, it's a really nice property of, uh, of the cell. And you don't mind a quick follow-up, you feel it's, it's safer, it's cheaper, it's domestically sourced. I mean, you have a, a world of advantages that I feel like that you yeah. are positioned to view the way that you do things differently from the rest. Yeah, and we're, I mean, we're doing grid scale energy storage uh, systems, right? So it's, these are giant batteries that are like power plant scale, and they, what they do is they shift power from uh, times when you're not using much power in the grid, maybe in the middle of the night or when it's not too hot, and then they ship it. You can use it when, uh, when power is constrained. And most people don't know this if you don't know much about the grid, but there's like 30% reserve capacity in the US. I'm sure it's probably similar in Canada. 
And uh, that means that we're like underutilizing the grid by that much. And if you put batteries there, you basically free up, like you could free up most of that capacity for other applications. In fact, if you look like for data centers, right, there was a study that came out of Duke a few months ago that said, if you put a two hour battery at every new data center, you can add 90 gigawatts of capacity in the US uh, and, and Canada without adding one watt of new generation. And that's more than we plan to build in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So like batteries, if you, there's all this, like there's a lot of very well-founded talk and anxiety about how are we gonna grow the grid fast enough and not raise rates for everybody. The way you do that is with batteries. Uh, and so that's like, it's a foundational technology to enable this transition. The reason we pick sodium is because we think it's the best fit technology for that. It's for all the same reasons, like the supply chain benefit that you mentioned, it's safer, um, it's cheap, there's nothing expensive inside the battery, it can leverage all the lithium ion benefits in the supply chain. And the other one that is, uh, um, it has a much higher temperature operating range, which is really important for energy storage systems because a lot of the cost and maintenance and even safety problems involved with, uh, with traditional grid storage and lithium ion is, is like cooling systems and, and things like that. So you're able to eliminate and make the whole system much simpler. Yeah. Nicholas, there's so much hype out there. I feel like from where you're positioned, you're choosing strategically where to, where to invest quite literally, right? And there's so much noise, there's hype, there's all these shiny things to pay attention to and, yep. and not to be dismissive of, of good hearted startups, but I got to imagine it's a huge challenge for you to separate signal from noise. How do you know to align yourself with someone that has an innovative, forward-thinking solution yep. like you view Landon and, and his team at Peak Energy versus maybe a, another handful of possibilities to choose who to invest in? How do you separate the signal from the noise? Uh, well, first, I think part of it is imagining the future and backcasting to what's needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, two, I think, is to do a long research, what we call deep exploration. I think we are the only VC firm I know. You go on the website and we list all the deep explorations we are doing right now. So when we are telling entrepreneurs, well, we don't know about the space, we can't invest, they can check the website. But these deep explorations are based from what our investment team decides to research. It's passion-based. It's what they believe is the next thing they have to solve. And if you think about VC, we really do well if we invest four years before it's obvious to everyone else. So we have to think about this future and what is needed to get to that future. Now, of course, I don't like the fact that our bet on the fragmented world future is happening, but at the same time, we are mitigating for the effect of that fragmented world by investing in the right technology. On top of peak energy, for example, we invested in type one energy, which is nuclear fusion. I think 100 years from now, society will ask, why did we not start quicker on nuclear fusion? And that's the kind of things you need to think about, is what are the key building blocks which gets us to a better future, regardless of the future being maybe not as good as we want to. Yeah, um, I, I'm lucky enough to have been a moderator at, at several web summit conferences around the world, and I, I always like pulling in the local angle. And, and in our conversation from last week, it was very clear that, that you both view the nation of Canada is a really strategic and a really crucial ally in terms of mining mm -hmm. and refining. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to our audience about why you view this nation, this country, mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously so in the headlines for so many reasons right now, but is so important to our programming at Web Summit this year and, and how it fits into your space? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for any, like, any uh, uh, process industry, Canada is almost like an ideal, because you have a lot of raw materials here, you have a lot of excess like hydropower, um, a deep, uh, uh, tradition and, and strong confidence in process industry, refining, you know, uh, aluminum processing, all this stuff. So, like, those types of industries are, um, oil and gas, you know, translates pretty well to a lot of these things. So, I think that is sort of a natural symbiotic relationship with, uh, with batteries, for instance, because you need to make, like, cathodes, anodes. These, these are really, you know, even rolled uh, foils and things like that. So, um, in terms of component supply, it's a it's a huge um, uh, a huge benefit to have to have Canada here and, and able to sort of supply those those components into the industry. Yeah. So you talked about Canada. I'll talk about Vancouver. <laughs> so uh, we uh, we invest in Canada, but one of our startups is called PH7, and they do metal recycling. Think about PGM type of metals. And if you think about the future, you want to avoid mining in the first place. One of the easy thing to do is just to recycle the metal you've already extracted and recycle it. We also made an investment so outside Canada, but in the US, called Ascend Elements, which is doing battery recycling and upcycling the lithium back to whatever materials you need for doing the next batteries. I, need to, I think we need to think about mining is we have to do, 
but how do we maximize what we have already taken out of the earth and recycle it? Uh, we have just a few moments left here, but uh, there's a really fascinating, a very important conversation going back, uh, happening back at home in the, in the United States, home for some of us here in Washington, D.C. President Trump calls it the big, beautiful bill. Uh, those of us that are a little wonkier in the in the day to day on Capitol Hill, we call it the budget reconciliation process. Landon, I know that this is the type of legislation when we talk about emerging technologies really needing very crucial government or regulatory support. This is a really important bill. This is the one bite at the apple that Republicans yep. in Washington get right now, and it intersects with what you're trying to do a lot. Talk to me about some of your concerns or things you're paying attention to yep. as this really important bill is, uh, is moving its way through the yep. U.S. Senate. I mean, I think that the things that are important to know is that, that it's, it's sort of it's a lot of tax cuts and, and uh, spend items that they need to cover with, with some revenue generating or pay-fors is what they call them. One of the areas that, that the pay for is coming from is, is um, basically changes to the IRA, which was legislation that, that makes it possible to build battery factories in the US. It also, uh, and a lot of people don't know this, is it, it makes it much easier and more economical to invest in the grid. So if you look at like grid capacity over the last 30 years, and you compare maybe the US to China, the US is basically flat, China's like a, a rocket ship. And they, they cross, you know, what, 10, 15 years ago, now China's like more than double our capacity and they're adding substantially more every year than we are, really because we were flat for so long. And if you look at that graph, two years ago it started to go up again, mm. right? And that was the IRA. And like, Inflation Reduction Act. It, sorry, yeah, no, Inflation no, Reduction Act, right. exactly. And if, if the current, the House passed a version of the bill that's with the Senate right now, whatever you think about green or like climate change, whatever, you don't have to worry about any of that. that. That's actually not even relevant to this debate. It's whether we want to have a competitive economic proposition against uh, China, who is probably a geopolitical rival for Canada, for the US, for the West. We need to add capacity to our grid. It's foundational for everything we, the, the next 100 years are gonna be about. And uh, you know, repealing the IRA takes that away. Batteries are a huge part of that, solar, wind. You need everything to make this work. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas, finally, you've got about 20, 20 seconds or so left. What most excites you about uh, being where you're situated in venture capital for the exciting technology? I think I really am happy to be able to invest in solutions like Peak Energy, Type 1 Energy, AM Batteries, which is a solvent-free battery process, because you need more tool set into our electrification and energy resilience than we have today. And if you think about the grid, and it's not just the uh, capacity, but also the congestion of the grid, you need battery storage on the generation side and on the usage side. And I think you have the right solution that we need, but we need the government to support that so that we avoid this dependence on other countries. Absolutely, uh, fantastic conversation. I'm very grateful to both of you, Nicholas and Landon. Thank you so much, and thank you all as well thank for you. taking the time. Thank One you. more time for our panelists.